Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Offelt. I'm the director of the McDevitt Center for Creativity and Innovation here at Lemoyne College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this third lecture in our ongoing series of talks uh, devoted to the subject of science and religion in modern America. This evening, Professor Thomas Tracy of Bates College will be speaking. And in a moment, I'll introduce Father George Coyne to introduce our speaker. I'm going to take just a moment to do a little bit of business with you all. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask that during the question and answer period, you actually power down cell phones. Don't simply put them in silent mode, but actually turn them off. These wireless mics, which are uh, essential for not only us being able to hear your questions, but equally importantly for the, the cameras to be able to hear your questions, uh, produce massive amounts of feedback if there are cell phone signals. Um, I'd also like to ask uh, that you silence cell phones now, if you have them on. Now that I'm done giving you directions, I'd like to give you an invitation. Um, after the talk and the question and answer period, we'd like to invite you all to join us and the speaker for continued conversation in the Drescher community room, which is just through these doors where we'll provide some nice sweets and coffee um, and an opportunity to continue talking. Lastly, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to let you know that I mentioned this series of, of talks is ongoing. In the spring semester, we will be hosting another three lectures, um, the first already starting up on February 7th. Uh, by J. Matthew Ashley, the chair of the Department of Theology at Notre Dame. And then March 14th, a talk by Robert Russell of Union Theological in Berkeley, California. And then in April, Nancy Murphy of the uh, School of Theology and Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Um, so I'd like to invite you to keep those things on your schedule. We will be, we have a, a flyer announcing them and we'll be producing another. Um, lastly, I'd like to uh, let you know, if you don't know, that the McDevitt Center website has recordings of past lectures that you can watch online. Uh, we, we're also happy to make DVDs available if you'd like them. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to go to that website where you'll find a link to the McDevitt Center blog, which provides all kinds of interesting information about what the McDevitt Center is doing, not only with our science and religion initiative, but with other initiatives uh, that we're, we're hosting, co-sponsoring, or sponsoring. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Father George Coyne. How nice that you're all here. And I'm beginning to recognize a lot of faces, and that makes it nice. Uh, I'm really privileged to introduce Professor Thomas Tracy. It's going to be Tom Tracy from here on, Tom because we've known one another for many years. I generally, as you know, rely upon you to have looked at the biography and all and not spend a lot of time introducing a speaker because we want to hear the speaker. But I'm going to take a few moments because I think Tom's relationship to his own college and the nature of Lemoyne College are very important for this evening's talk. Uh, Tom did his uh, bachelor's degree at St. Olaf College which in Minnesota, which is a Lutheran-inspired, founded in 1874. He did his master's degree and then his PhD at Yale University. Tom has spent 
at Bates College, as I estimate, Tom, you started teaching there in 1976 while you were still doing your PhD work, but he's there continuously since 1980 when he finished his PhD at Yale. The reason I say that is because of the nature of Bates College and the nature of Le Moyne College, if you'll allow me a moment. Lest you think he is an ivory tower academic, he's very active in his own state of Maine. He served on numerous health care and ethics committees for his state. I name a few just to give you an idea. He's been a consultant to the advisory group group for tough choices in health care. What more sort of topical issue could there be? He's been on the ethics committee for the Maine General Hospital. I'm very proud to say that Tom has been associated in conferences with a number of eminent science religion centers throughout the United States and the world. He's been involved with Princeton Theological Seminary, with Harvard Divinity School, with the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, and believe it or not, with the Vatican Observatory. <laughs> I made a little pitch, didn't I? <laughs> At the Vatican Observatory, Tom participated in several conferences, four or five, I think, Tom. I'm gonna put you on the uh, sort of uh, tap here. The latest conference was the one uh, in 2007, specifically dated to the topic of this evening's lecture. And Tom gave a paper entitled, The Lawfulness of Nature and the Problem of Evil. Sounds a little bit. And I'm going to take the opportunity to quote you and kind of put you on the stick, Tom. I'm quoting Tom's abstract to this paper. We live in a universe characterized by improbable fecundity and ever-present perishing. And as we rejoice in the former and mourn the latter, we cannot help but wonder whether it has to be this way. Tom, you've been pondering that for quite a number of years, and I'm sure you still are, and so we're delighted to have you share that pondering with us. Now, I would like to extend these remarks just a moment because of the nature of Bates College and Le Moyne College. Bates was founded in 1855, over 150 years ago, by people who believe strongly in freedom, civil rights, and the importance of higher education for all who could benefit from it. The college is recognized for its inclusive social character. There are no fraternities, no sororities, and student organizations are open to all. At Bates, Students and faculty form a community of scholars who share a thirst for learning, drawing on the methods of the sciences, the patterns of logic and language, the study of societies, and expression in the arts. If you ask a Bates graduate what they value most by the time they spent there, as often as not, you'll hear them say, Bates taught me how to think. Although Bates is, I made a careful calculation, four score and 10 years older than Le Moyne, I think honestly all my colleagues here can share the fact that we are a sister-brother institution to Bates from what I've already told you about Bates. So Tom, it's a special privilege to have you from Bates College here at Lemoyne College 
to share your knowledge with us. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you, George, for that lovely introduction. Uh, very appreciative of that. And I'm honored to be here as part of this, this lecture series. It's really a wonderful series that George has put together. I have to tell you, the last time that I saw Father Coyne was in Castel Gandolfo. And not to take anything away from Syracuse and Le Moyne, but that's a, that was an awfully nice place to get together. Um, George had, had hosted a series, as he mentioned, of wonderful conferences there that brought together uh, working scientists with people like me, theologian philosopher types, uh, and other kinds of people for conversations. Each conference focused on a different particular scientific topic. It was a terrific experience. It wouldn't have happened and, or have happened as well if it hadn't been for George's work on it. And it's wonderful to see that, uh, that you're continuing that kind of dialogue here at Lemoyne. So I'm really pleased to be part of this. The other thing I want to say is to offer a special word of appreciation and welcome to anyone here who's a student or a faculty member because you're in the same, exactly the same point of the academic year that we are at Bates College. This is our last week of the semester. Tomorrow's the last day of classes there, and I understand it is here too. <clears throat> and that's a particularly crazy time of year. I was getting emails, anxious emails from students in the wee hours of the morning last night. So thank you so for coming. It's, uh, it's really great that you would be able to take the time and, and do this. Let me also point out that there is a handout circulating, okay? This is, I just want to mention that this is the very latest technological innovation. You know, many people use PowerPoint. <clears throat> but with PowerPoint, you have to sit there and look at a, a blue screen and, and get a sore neck trying to read what's on the screen. Uh, and this, you have it right there in front of you. And you can write on it, and you can take it home. So it's, it's really quite advanced. OK, so what I want to do is to di discuss with you some of the deeper issues <clears throat> that arise in thinking about the relation between evolutionary theory and theology. We're all aware, of course, of the endless and, I have to say, dispiriting conflict between various forms of creationism and evolution. This seems to be a peculiarly American preoccupation. The issue hardly registers in continental Europe. Uh, and it's begun to show up a bit in Great Britain, but largely as a result of the efforts of American evangelicals to spread the anti-evolutionary word uh, over there. The, the central social political struggle in this country, of course, is over what should be taught in the public schools and <clears throat> in the biology classrooms. And every few years, a fresh controversy breaks out when the opponents of evolution gain enough seats on a school board someplace to pursue the latest strategy for undercutting the teaching of evolutionary science. It's unlikely, I think, that that uh, confrontation is going to end anytime soon, given that, uh, according to a Gallup poll back in June, roughly 46% of the US public rejects evolution and affirms that God created human beings in their present form sometime in the last 10,000 years, 46%. Uh, in fact, you may have seen in the press just this week, there was an interview with uh, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, who is an up and coming potential presidential candidate for uh, uh, 2016, Republican Party, <clears throat> where he was asked about the uh, age of the earth. And he said, quoting him, whether the Earth was created in seven days or seven actual eras, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to answer that. It's one of the great mysteries. OK, it's uh, one of the pundits comment on this said it may have been a mystery back in the 17th century, uh, back when Bishop Usher calculated you know, the history of humanity. We were created, as it turned out, on October 22nd, 4004 BC, right? But um, it's not as mysterious now as it was then. So there we are. I mean, this is a part of, of, a, of a public American life, quite prominent, uh, and it's a little uh, worrisome. 
One of the things that happens in these kinds of controversies that are so protracted and so passionate, where people care so much about it, is that the opponents um, uh, on either side tend to end up confirming um, the worst opinions of the people on the other side. So on the one side we've got, on the religious side, we often find simple, literalistic appeals to the Bible. And it's important to point out that the problems with fundamental and fundamentalism and literalism are first and foremost theological rather than scientific. Biblical literalism should be rejected not simply because it generates scientifically implausible claims, but because its handling of the text is doomed from the outset. There simply can be no literal reading of scripture when the text is internally complex. And that's nicely illustrated by noting that any supposed literal restatement of biblical teaching on creation is gonna to need to somehow harmonize two quite different narratives in the opening chapters of Genesis, the six day creation story and the Garden of Eden story. There are lots of ways that that can be done to harmonize those two things. But the point is that each of these ways of harmonizing the stories is gonna involve making choices about how to resolve tensions within the text. And to insist that any one of these readings is the literal restatement of scripture's divinely authorized content is, is to refuse to acknowledge and defend that reading as a creative act of interpretation. And that ends the theological conversation at just the point where it should begin. That is, as a discussion of how to read the text. It substitutes instead an assertion of authority that my reading uh, coincides with God's own truth, a kind of hermeneutical imperialism. There used to be in Maine, I, you may have had it out here too, a uh, fairly common bumper sticker uh, that said, read, the Bible said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That seemed to me like kind of a helpful warning just in case uh, I was ever inclined to pull alongside a car and start a theological conversation with the driver. In fact, I was, I was stopped in traffic once, and uh, the car in front of me had that bumper sticker on one side. On the other side, it had a bumper sticker that said, God, guns, and guts made America great. So I figured it was kind of a package deal. Sort of. So on the other side, on the scientific side, we have a bunch of scientists who draw a straight line from modern evolutionary biology to triumphalist atheism. I'm thinking here people like Richard Dawkins and in cosmology, Steven Weinberg. They raise provocative challenges that deserve to be discussed. But they also push well beyond the bounds of evolutionary science in their eagerness to debunk theism in all its forms. The move from evolution to atheism or to any other large scale conclusion about our place in the universe can't be justified by biology alone but requires the backing of the sciences that the sciences themselves cannot provide. That's a point that needs to be made repeatedly. The debate is often not so much between religion and science as between contending large scale philosophical and metaphysical views. Of course, given the authority of science in our culture, it's easy to understand the temptation to put on one's white laboratory coat, which is the sacred robe of the sciences, and make pronouncements that have no grounding in science itself. One of the ironies of this whole creation evolution debate in our society is that some of the fiercest antagonists, antagonists on each side share a key belief. The creationist opponents of evolution and the scientific or scientistic opponents of theism agree that if evolutionary theory is affirmed, then something essential to theism must be denied. So one side concludes from this that evolutionary theory must be false, and the other concludes that theism must be false. And those of you studying logic will know that this is a choice between modus ponens and modus tollens. So in one way, well, you can run the argument either direction. The obvious counter in that situation is to deny the shared premise and argue that a scientifically careful understanding of evolution is compatible with an appropriately nuanced theology. 
That response to evolutionary theory has been around a long time. It, uh, it emerged very early in the discussion that was triggered by the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859. Already in the 1860s, Asa Gray, who was an eminent botanist at Harvard, was vigorously defending Darwin's new theory and contending that this revolutionary understanding of nature need not be at odds with Christian theology. In understanding this debate in its early context, it's important to recall that part of the shock of Darwin's theory was that it came as a direct challenge to the then dominant version of the argument from design. And some of you are probably well aware of William Paley's famous version of this argument, his analogy of the watch and the watchmaker. Suppose that you're out walking in the countryside and you glance down and you spot a pocket watch among the stones. It would be absurd, Paley said, to suppose that this clever arrangement of gears and springs was just a spontaneous product of natural forces. So too, he argued, it's absurd to insist that the functional organization of living things is a result of natural processes alone. The evidence of design provides strong rational support for the conclusion that there is a divine designer whose wise providence is everywhere illustrated in the marvelous suitability of each organism to its place in nature. It's hardly an exaggeration to say that every well-educated person in the first half of the 19th century was aware of this general line of argument. The training of Anglican clergy routinely included thorough studies of the writings of William Paley. And so here's another delightful irony, one of my favorites. Among the students being educated in this way was a young Charles Darwin. In the late uh, 1820s, Darwin was a student at Cambridge taking a degree in divinity. That's because he'd washed out of medical school. And his father, Robert, didn't want young Charles to become an idle sporting man, as he put it. And so he insisted that if his son didn't have the aptitude for anything else, he could at least become a parson in the Church of England. <laughs> I figured that line in a Catholic audience might be well received. So. Uh, <clears throat> Many years later, uh, long after the publication of The Origin of Species, Darwin remarked in his autobiography that it was careful attention to Paley's evidences of Christianity that was, quote, the only part of the academical course which, as I then felt and as I still believe, was of the least use to me in the education of my mind, end quote. So Darwin really loved Paley's writings in part because Paley paid such close attention to anatomy. If you can find an old copy of uh, the Natural Theology, there are biological plates, drawings, in the back of that, of that volume. Um, and Darwin studied those closely. But Darwin understood that his sweeping new vision of biological modification through natural selection came as a profound challenge to this familiar theology of nature. It had the effect he recognized of putting Paley's God out of a job. This was a deeply disturbing idea to many of Darwin's contemporaries, including some fellow scientists who had previously been his allies, people like Richard Owen and Adam Sedgwick. But not everybody reacted with religious alarm to Darwin's new theory. Here in the US, as I mentioned, uh, the botanist Asa Gray immediately embraced evolutionary theory. And he argued tirelessly for its compatibility with belief in God. Gray recognized that even though natural selection could explain the beautifully adapted structures of living things without the need for a divine designer, God could nonetheless be rehired for a higher level job, uh, namely as the author of the evolutionary process itself. God sort of gets um, kicked upstairs from retail to wholesale or from the factory floor to management. Okay, it seems like a more appropriate job. Um, <clears throat> that's the core concept of theistic evolution, and it remains a prominent option today. Evolution on this view is God's clever way of making living things make themselves. Part of the appeal of that view is that it encompasses evolutionary processes within the scope of God's creative will, and it does this 
while affirming the explanatory autonomy and integrity of the biological sciences. So whatever the successes or failures, the sufficiency or limits of evolutionary theory at any moment in its development, this account of God's relation to nature can be sustained without insisting that biology, for its own sake, needs to invoke God in its explanations. This is what makes the idea of theistic evolution different from intelligent design theory. So it's a great urge, this idea on Darwin. Uh, and in spite of its potential to deflect some of the religious controversy, Darwin steadfastly rejected it. He offered a number of, of objections to Gray's strategy um, for reconciling theology and evolution. I want to focus on one in this discussion, uh, and that is the problem of suffering and death in the struggle for life. Darwin's close observation of nature made him acutely aware of how costly the process of natural selection tends to be for the creatures who are subject to it. He was a kind-hearted man. If you read his letters and so on, you can't help but sort of grow to love Darwin. Uh, and so he found the intricate interweaving of living and dying, of eating and being eaten, to be both magnificent and appalling. And some of his remarks about this in his letters have become quite famous. Writing to Asa Gray, uh, responding to Gray's proposals, Darwin says, this is quoting him uh, from 1860, I cannot see as plainly as others do, and I should, as I should wish to, evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created parasitic wasps, wasps with, the intent, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, or that a cat should play with mice. Uh, in another letter, he remarked, um, quote, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low and horribly cruel works of nature. That's my problem that I'm gonna take on tonight. It's a profound problem. And it's one of the deepest sources of tension between theology and evolution, far deeper than the endless shouting match about the six days of creation and the age of the earth. If we say, as I suggested above, that evolution is God's way of making creatures make themselves, then God is thoroughly implicated in the world's many miseries. Suffering and death are necessary consequences of fundamental processes in nature, and they play an integral role in the development of life. If God brings into being the whole magnificent diversity of life by means of evolution, then death has an important place in God's creative purposes. We can see just how difficult this problem is by considering the impact of evolutionary theory on one of the most familiar theological explanations of the presence of evil in the world. According to a broadly Augustinian reading of the story of the fall in Genesis, the world as God created it originally um, was an un unambiguously good and it included as the crown of creation human beings living in a state of untroubled freedom and moral innocence. God's intention was that the world should persist in this original perfection, with human beings flourishing in free obedience to God's will. But God's good creation was disrupted by a rationally inexplicable act of rebellion. Suffering and death entered the world only as a consequence of the fall of humanity into sin, a fall in which all of creation mysteriously participated. Human beings were plunged into physical hardship and moral confusion, and the rest, as we say, is history. If we accept some version of an evolutionary account of human origins, then we're gonna find it very difficult to sustain the story I just told you as a true description of our history. We now live after the fall in a modern second sense of that phrase, that is, we live after the demise of this traditional understanding of the fall as an historical event. 
But because this story, theological storyline is so deeply embedded in the structure of Christian thought, giving it up involves more extensive revision than is often recognized. The, the, the new evolutionary story has at least two important consequences for the way we think about suffering and evil. So on this outline, we're at Roman numeral two after the fall. <clears throat> First of these is that the Augustinian story made natural suffering a consequence of human uh, moral failure. But the evolutionary story shifts the primary responsibility for natural suffering to the choice that God made to create a world of this sort. Second, the evolutionary story complicates, in what I think are fascinating ways, the story we tell about moral evil and sin. So I want to say a little bit more about, about that problem in particular. Uh, our powers of thought and action emerge from a long evolutionary history. Any plausible account of, of human moral life must acknowledge that our choices are deeply conditioned and constrained by this history, a physical, uh, uh, by this history, and by physical circumstances that lie beyond our control. That's evident in the in the simple fact that we're organisms of a specific kind. Our moral capacities are rooted in this biological context. They are lodged in this flesh and we grapple with moral questions as they arise for animals of our kind. So for example, it is as bodies vulnerable to hunger and cold that we ask what obligations we have to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. It's also as vulnerable bodies that we ask who is my neighbor and by imp implication who is not because we fear for our own well-being if we don't limit the scope of our sharing. So moral life bears the marks of our finitude, of our physical and cognitive limits. On the one hand, we're profoundly social creatures, and our remarkable and potentially disastrous success as a species almost certainly owes a great deal to our capacity to coordinate our activity in complex cooperative relationships. But at the same time, our ability to see ourselves as a member of a community with shared interests seems to be most effective when the social group is small and local. And we readily form fears and antagonisms toward others who seem to be different from us. Even in our closest networks of relationship, we are prone to conflict as we pursue our differing interests and compete for resources that we at least perceive to be limited. The range of our sympathetic imagination is limited, and our concern for one another's good is dampened by the mundane preoccupations of daily life, by anxious self-concern, uh, by ordinary fatigue. Now, at this point, a whole host of subtle and really fascinating questions arise about the contours of our freedom, its boundaries and limits, about the fixity or the flexibility of the agenda for action that we inherit. Uh, from our biology and psychology. I don't want to presume very much about the answer to these questions. My point is just that if we give up the historical fall, we can't readily sort out the aspects of our moral lives that reflect our natural limitations, our finitude, and those that, are, that express our failed moral freedom. We don't experience a, mor a morally innocent finitude, a creatureliness untouched by sin. This was acknowledged, of course, by the classical theological anthropology that held that we all live after the fall in the traditional non-ironic meaning of that phrase. Uh, on this traditional view, the innocence of the human race was a postulated state of affairs before history, a prehistory. Um, this was a hypothesis that vindicated the goodness of God's original creation and explained the, moral amb the morally ambiguous predicament in which we now find ourselves. But if we give up the story of the fall, then our current entanglement in moral evil appears to be our natural condition. All right? As opposed to being a departure from, our, from an original innocence from which we fell. It may still be possible to argue that there was some period of moral innocence in the history of the human species. 
But it seems more plausible to think that moral life emerged as human groups learned to impose constraints on behavior, to offer praise and blame, and to reflect on these practices. This suggests that moral consciousness arose among human beings from the start as an awareness both of being subject to moral norms and, and simultaneously of being involved in moral shortcoming. Those two things come together. And it's worth noticing that in the story of the fall, just that point is made, that namely when the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened and they became self-aware, what they saw in themselves caused shame. Moral awareness and an awareness of moral wrongdoing simultaneous. The result of this new understanding of human origins is that natural limitation and moral failure are very closely, very tightly linked. So tightly linked that we may wonder whether finitude leads necessarily to sin. If so, notice what happens. If so, then moral evil would be naturalized. That is, regarded as a consequence of the natural conditions under which freedom emerges and is exercised. This reverses the pattern of the myth of the fall. Rather than explaining natural evil as a consequence of morally wrong choices, this view explains moral evils as a consequence of natural limitation. Now, that's a problem in Christian theology. Christian theology has always resisted that conclusion. It's insisted on the goodness of God's creation and therefore has insisted that our natural limitations as finite creatures are not themselves the source of evil. The, I think the crucial theological consideration there is that sin must not be regarded as essential to human nature. That is, it must be possible in principle to be human and yet not sin, even if this possibility is almost never actualized in fact, except in traditional Christology in the case of Jesus and perhaps, since I'm speaking here in a Catholic context, in the case of his mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 20, there's a 20th century American theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, who, who expressed this idea famously by saying that although sin is inevitable, it is not necessary. The basic idea here is that it's not easy to be human. We have the gift and the curse of self-awareness, of being able to consciously shape the course of our own lives while simultaneously knowing that life is a risky business which always ends in the same way. The inevitable result uh, is that we become anxious and we react to that anxiety in ways that do damage to ourselves and others. We seek to secure our own interests, even if this comes at a high cost to the vital interests of others. We tend to form an exaggerated opinion of our own importance uh, and then are disappointed when others don't share that view. Uh, we look for happiness in activities and achievements that can't provide it. Uh, we find our relationships disrupted by contests of power and injuries, injuries to one another's self-esteem. And indeed, where would, where would country western music be without these dynamics of disappointment and betrayal. One, one of my favorite country western lyrics is, uh, I've been so miserable since you left me, baby. It's almost like having you here. <laughs> uh, I think there's a deep insight contained in that, in that line. So this analysis of the human predicament is rich and it's illuminating. But its effect is to show that our moral freedom, as it is given to us by God via the natural world, is rather fragile. It is structured in a way that seems to set up a universal bias, a kind of gravitational curvature of human nature towards sin. So if we accept an evolutionary account of human origins and give up the claim of an historical fall, then both natural and moral evils are tied quite closely to God's creative act. And that deepens the problem of evil. So I've spent all this time making the problem more and more difficult. What can we say about how to address it? Um, why would God create a world of this sort, a world whose history unfolds through evolutionary processes, both cosmological and biological, that generates so much suffering and loss and moral risk. I think there's some 
helpful things that we can say in response to this question. But I also want to argue that there are important limits on our ability to offer reasoned explanations for evil. The suggestions I want to offer about why a loving and omnipotent God would create a world so steeped in suffering, those suggestions quickly lead to questions that theists and atheists alike are in no position to answer. Questions that push beyond the reach of our powers of understanding. The problem of evil is not one that we're going to be able to solve. But it's important to remember that the focus of the Christian faith is on what God is doing to liberate and redeem the creation from its sorrows, and not on why God permitted them in the first place. Christianity and the other Abrahamic traditions are religions of salvation, not explanation, though you sometimes have to remind philosophers of that, philosophers of religion. Um, and that, this is a point I'll return to uh, at the end. But this doesn't mean that we can just ignore the demand for an explanation. We can't avoid the question of how it can be that God created a world that needs to be saved. So any attempt to respond to the problem of evil is going to have to grapple with three key questions. And these are on that handout somewhere, three key questions under, under Roman, Roman numeral three. What is the good for the sake of which God permits evils? What is the relation of evils to this good? And is it consistent with God's perfect goodness to pursue this end in this way? The first two questions lay out the basic strategy of virtually any response to the problem of evil, namely to identify a good that cannot be secured without permitting various evils. And then the third question states an important moral requirement that a theodicy must meet. It's not enough just to identify a good that's, that is unavoidably accompanied by evil. In addition, this good must be worth having even at this price. This is the question, those of you who are familiar with the Brothers Karamazov, this is the question that Ivan Karamazov asks in that famous chapter titled Rebellion. So what can we say about the good for the sake of which God permits evils in the world? Christianity and the Abrahamic traditions generally, I think, understand this good as relational. The whole created good has its uh, the whole created world has its good in its being in relation to God. This means that we have to acknowledge a vast array of non-human goods in creation. We must move beyond our anthropocentrism, and we must expand the scope of our recognition of value beyond the goods of persons to the good of all creation. But initially, I want to try to sketch a line of argument that begins with the good as we know it. Philosophical discussions of the problem of evil typically direct us to the value of moral life. That's the key move in the free will defense that some of you probably are quite familiar with. But in the context of the Christian faith, the good is a great deal richer than, than this. It includes not simply the natural goods of physical, mental, and moral life, but also the transcendent good of communion with God, classically understood as participation in the love which is God's inner Trinitarian life. So free will arguments don't stand alone, uh, but enter into the discussion only if we think that moral freedom plays a role in preparing us to participate in the relational good that God intends for us. That's the, the strategy that is pursued by what have come to be called soul-making theodicies, uh, which contend that if we are to grow into moral personhood, God must permit us to make choices in which something of moral significance is at stake, choices that have consequences for ourselves and others. But as we just saw, the exercise of moral freedom by a creature that is limited in the ways we are, physically, cognitively, emotionally, socially, leads inevitably to moral evil. So this takes us an important step toward explaining God's permission of moral evils. But what about natural suffering? What about all the forms of suffering and loss and death that result just from the ordinary operation of the natural order, quite apart from the morally wrong choices of human beings? Some theologians have suggested that we can develop a free process defense for natural evils, 
parallel to the free will argument that I just sketched out. John Polkinghorne is well known for that view. Uh, he's probably the best known proponent of this approach. So let me quote him. He says, a world allowed to make itself through the evolutionary exploration of its potentiality is a better world than one produced ready-made by divine fiat. So the idea here is that all else being equal, it's better if the world, kind of like a piece of furniture from Ikea, does not come from God's hand fully assembled, but instead is in some respects self-assembling, unlike pieces of furniture from Ikea. You, like me, have probably struggled with those. So as this self-assembly process takes place, God is committed to respecting the integrity of nature by allowing it to operate according to its own lawful structure without divine intervention that would disturb its causal history. I think this is in many ways uh, an appealing idea and it seems to fit the way the world works. But the critical question, if you're considering the problem of evil, is that we have to ask whether God is justified in adopting, adopting this hands-off policy. Is the autonomous functioning of the system of nature a great enough good in itself to justify all the suffering and loss that results from events running their course untouched? It seems to me that that is a difficult case to make. It would require arguing, for example, that the misery arising from the plague epidemic of 1348 or the flu pandemic of 1918 or the spread of HIV or indeed all of the agonies of sentient creatures of all species throughout evolutionary history, that all of that is a morally acceptable price to pay just for the existence and unobstructed operation of a self-developing, lawful, natural order. If the, free will, if the free process defense is not itself morally defensible, then is there another way to explain why God would create a world structured by causal laws that result in suffering and death. One way to approach this question is to reflect further on the necessary conditions for moral life and personhood with which we began. Rational agents must be able to make sense of the world in which they act, anticipate the consequences of action, and consider alternative, personal, per, per, alternative possibilities. Um, that requires that, our, that their world, our world, be organized in a way that is consistent and predictable. Rational action would not be possible at all if events succeeded one another randomly, failing to form any reliable patterns. A moral agent's world then must necessarily have a stable and intelligible structure. But what sort of structure? It doesn't follow just from the requirement of predictability that the world must work in such a relentlessly impersonal way. Human beings have perhaps always longed for a world organized by a principle of retributive justice. And pious defenders of God's moral integrity, like Job's friends, if you're familiar with that story in the Bible, have often claimed that ours is such a world, even in the face of evident facts to the contrary. But it's not difficult to see that such a world would not be well suited to the formation of rational moral agents. So join me briefly in a thought experiment. Suppose God were to establish a natural order in which only those who deserve to suffer from natural misfortune do so. If, for example, you tell a self-serving lie, uh, and given the time of academic year, my example this would be say you a student tells a professor that their paper's late because their computer malfunctioned. That's sort of the modern version of the dog ate my homework. Right? I've heard that students do sometimes tell such stories. It's never, it never happens at Bates and I'm sure it never happens at Le Moyne. Um, but suppose that were to, were to happen. Your misdeed would be followed by some appropriate punishment, say a boil, suffering from a boil, like those that Satan inflicted on Job. And I'll leave you to figure out where the boil is located. Um, compassion toward the sufferer, think about that, would be morally problematic because it would express sympathy for that person's wrongdoing. 
and any attempt to ease his misery through medical care would be bound to fail because if the boil were treated, another would just spring up to replace it until the underlying moral problem were addressed. Okay? What we really ought to do in such a world, like Job's companions, is to urge the sufferer to repent. But a world that works this way would be a cosmic Skinner box that maintains us in a perpetual moral childhood, prodded by immediate rewards and punishments. It's not clear that in such a world we could ever learn to do what is right for its own sake. Um, Kantian virtue would be hard to come by. So it looks like if moral agency is to be possible, uh, then the world must have a lawful, impersonal, and amoral structure. In a world that meets those conditions, it'll be possible to get hurt simply by virtue of the lawful operation of the natural order. Suffering will not always be deserved. If it rains, it'll rain on the just and the unjust. This is a crucially important point. The mistake of Job's companions, uh, whether ancient or modern, is that they feel compelled to provide a morally sufficient, a morally justifying reason for each instance of natural misfortune. And ironically, that gives natural evils too much meaning. In a system of, of um, impersonal natural law, physical hardship and suffering will sometimes occur for no reason other than that the causal structures of nature generate them. These evils will be a byproduct, a side effect, of structuring the world in a way that makes moral personhood possible. So if the universe is to include creatures suited for personal communion with God, then natural evils must be distributed according to natural law and not in conformity to a moral principle. There will, as a result, be an unavoidable arbitrariness about the hazards of life in the system of nature. This takes us I think a considerable distance toward explaining why God would create a world that includes natural and moral evils. But of course, this is not the end of the argument. Uh, there are lots of objections that can be raised at this point. I wanna just raise two and discuss them briefly. Too many pieces of paper here. The first of these two objections. Um, the account I've sketched helps us understand why the world contains at least some natural evils, but it doesn't explain why the world contains so many. It seems obvious that God could and therefore should do a better job of preventing or ameliorating evils. That's one objection. Second objection, this account explains natural evil as a side effect of meeting conditions necessary for moral freedom but only a vanishingly small proportion of living things are moral agents. And if no additional rationale is given for natural suffering, then we're left with a narrowly anthropocentric, or at least person-centered, view in which all the rest of sentient creation pays an enormous price in suffering for a good in which it does not participate. Interestingly enough, Charles Darwin himself makes this point in his autobiography. Uh, he says, quote, some have attempted to explain suffering with reference to man by imagining that it serves for his moral improvement. But the number of men in the world is as nothing compared with all other sentient beings. And they offer suffer greatly without any moral improvement. So at this point, uh, the discussion that I wanna run through involves some typically philosophical point and counterpoints, what we do. Uh, and so I recognize there's a possibility that you may finish listening before I finish speaking. Um, that may already have happened. Um, and if that happens, I, I just ask you to wait a few minutes for me to catch up with you. Okay, I'll, I'll get there uh, pretty soon. Okay, so the first of these two objections has come to be known uh, in philosophical discussion as the evidential problem of evil. You may be familiar with it as the argument from neglect. Wes Wildman, who was here last month, uh, has put forward a powerful version of that argument. I don't know that he did that here, but he and I have had this argument for years. Not yet resolved, but after tonight it will be. Okay? Um, the best known philosophical version of this problem has been formulated by a philosopher by the name of philosopher of religion, by the name of William Rowe, Bill Rowe, 
One of the ways he makes his case is to argue that there are specific instances of terrible suffering that God could prevent without the loss of a greater good or without incurring any equivalent evil. Rowe says that the theist's own claims about God's goodness and God's power entail that God will not permit evils of this sort. So if we find these preventable evils, we must conclude that there is no God. Rowe gives an example, his now often discussed example, of a fawn in the forest that is trapped by a forest fire, terribly burned, and dies slowly and in great pain. What possible outweighing good could this serve? Rowe suggests that none of the goods that we're familiar with uh, will explain why God permits this suffering. And this, of course, is just one of innumerable such cases multiplied beyond imagining throughout the long evolutionary history of life on Earth. What reply can we give? Safe to say, we're not going to be able to supply a justifying explanation for each and every uh, instance of apparently preventable suffering throughout the history of the universe. The best we can do is show that cases like the fawn do not provide compelling evidence that there is no such uh, explanation. So let's think a bit more about the death of the fawn. When we ask about the purpose served by this suffering, we immediately start looking for a specific good result that flows from it and that would not be produced without it. But here we need to recall the point we just made about natural evils. Namely, they're not always related to goods as means to ends. Natural evils may occur simply as a consequence of establishing a lawful and impersonal system of nature, which is itself a necessary condition for the good that God intends. That point has important implications as we look at Rowe's argument. When the objector, like Rowe, holds up a vivid and disturbing instance of intense suffering and challenges us to show what good it produces, we can now reply that it's a mistake to think that we should be able to identify some specific good outcome produced by means of this specific evil. In the case of the fawn, the good may simply be the continued functioning of a, of a lawful system of natural relationships, along with the many goods that that system makes possible. So God has a purpose for permitting suffering of this kind, but a specific instance of natural suffering may itself have no purpose, that is, as a means to some specific good outcome. Okay, that's part of the response to Roe. But <laughs> you may already have thought of the next objection, which would go roughly like this. Okay, all right, says the objector, I'll grant you the point, the fond suffering is a consequence of maintaining the lawful structure of nature. But does this specific instance of suffering have to occur? Surely it's implausible to claim that if this fawn does not suffer and die in this horrible way, then the natural order as a whole will come unhinged. That sounds right, uh, but I wanna suggest that on closer examination, the question is a lot more complicated. Let's think for a minute about how God would prevent an individual instance of natural suffering. Roe doesn't discuss this, and he seems to suppose that we can, without too much trouble, uh, imagine God acting to, to add or subtract particular evils from the history of the universe. So let's think about two, two possible ways that God could do this. First, God might modify the overall design of the natural order. That is, the laws of nature uh, and or the initial conditions under which they operate. So as to avoid the chain of events that leads to this particular instance of suffering, that is, the fawn's injury and death. Or Alternatively, God, or God could do both. Second, God might intervene to prevent the fawn's injury or to eliminate its suffering. That's probably what Roe has in mind. An omnipotent being is capable of this kind of rescue operation. So why doesn't God do it? Each of those two possibilities raises some complex questions. Uh, but for my purposes, it's enough for us here just to note some overarching issues. First, the events we identify as evils don't occur in isolation. They belong to extensive webs of relationships extending backward and forward in time. Changes in any part of this network are gonna have implications elsewhere within it. 
And those consequences may be surprisingly far-reaching. Perhaps, as the objector says, improvements are possible. I mean, most of us uh, have a, a list of revisions we would like to make in the design of the universe. It's the uh, if I were God list. Surely you, like me, have one of those. Um, just, you know, something small, like eliminating the virus that caused the head cold I had last week. You hear the remnants of that cold in my hoarse voice. Um, to say nothing of eliminating Ebola or, or HIV. But none of us are in a position to make a reliable judgment about the implication of the changes we'd propose. It only appears to us that we can do so, say in the case of the fawn, because we consider in isolation a tiny, a tiny part of the overall network of events. Uh, a second response, if God were to intervene miraculously to prevent particular awful instances of suffering, there's gonna be a limit on how much of this God can do without undermining the lawfulness of the natural order. So another thought experiment, for the sake of simplicity, imagine that there's some optimal level of divine intervention um, beyond which the intelligibility of nature as a lawful structure would break down, okay? If the world were poised at that threshold, God would be able to eliminate particular evils like the fawn's suffering and death only by permitting some other, other evil, choose an example you want, um, uh, that would substitute for it. We can call these substitutable evils. On the other hand, if the world has not reached this threshold point, then some evils can be prevented without substitution. They represent excess evils beyond what must be permitted in preserving a lawful natural order. It's only these excess evils that pose a problem for God's goodness and power. I think you now can see what comes next. Here's the problem. We're never going to be in a position to tell the difference between substitutable evils and excessive evils. Even if the world includes no excessive evils, there will still be evils that are, in fact, preventable by God, but they'll be preventable only by the substitution of some comparable evil. This is the philosophical part of the conversation where I thought you might decide you're done listening. Um, <laughs> so from the observation that an instance of intense suffering doesn't serve as the means to any good outcome that we can see, but instead appears preventable without loss, we're not justified in drawing the conclusion that God ought, not, that God ought to eliminate it as excessive. We can't decide this question about evils, whether they're excessive or, or not, on a case-by-case -case basis. Instead, we need to assess the overall balance of goods and evils in the universe across its history. And that, of course, is a global judgment that exceeds our epistemic reach. We'd need to have something approaching om omniscience in order to make it. So as a result, you know, troubling individual instances of apparently pointless suffering like that of the fawn do not, in fact, provide good evidence of divine neglect. If this argument works, then it defeats the evidential argument from evil, but it, it's a bit of a pyrrhic victory, okay? The objector from evil can't claim to have shown that there are instances of suffering that God should have prevented, but neither is the theist in a position to show that there are no excessive evils or to tell a detailed story about why each evil must be permitted. We're left with a stalemate that reflects intrinsic limits on human understanding. And this, it seems to me, is the best we can hope for on the problem of evil. In fact, it's what we should have expected. Uh, as the poet of the book of Job makes resoundingly clear in God's speech from the whirlwind, we're in no position to comprehend the Creator's act, as though we could size up alternative worlds and determine that, as our politicians are sometimes forced to admit, mistakes were made. Uh, my argument amounts to a, a philosophical version of, of the speech from the whirlwind in the book of Job, uh, just minus the uh, biting di divine sarcasm. Um, what can we say about the second objection? If, if you can hang in there with me for a few more minutes. Um, what can we say about the second objection? The objection to the person-centered character of this explanation of natural suffering. 
Is the rest of sentient creation subjected to the rigors of evolutionary processes just so that there will be a suitable natural context for free rational agents? That has often been supposed. I think we ought not to suppose that. Uh, I want to offer two interconnected uh, lines of, of response to that. Uh, one that appeals to the imminent goods of creation and one that appeals to the transcendent good of redemption. So first on the imminent good of creation. Uh, it's true that most living things do not share in the good of moral freedom, um, but they do participate in the goods made possible by the structures of the creative wor created world. The most basic of these goods is simply the life that's made available to them within the system of nature. So we can sketch a line of argument here that is uh, parallel to the earlier analysis of the necessary conditions for morally significant freedom. Organisms of all kinds obviously require a consistent structure of causal relationships in order to exist and to flourish. Their lives arise within this structure and are possible apart from it. Further, life requires an ongoing exchange of energy and information uh, with the environment. And a crucial part of that exchange is the operation of feedback loops that modify behavior in response to environmental stimuli. So that in sufficiently complex animals, this includes powerfully motivating negative states that we know as pain and fear. This point is a commonplace in discussions of natural evils. Um, the experiential states that organisms seek to avoid play a crucial role in the dynamics of their survival and flourishing. But of course, not all such states serve any good end for the creature. Intense pain can persist even when there's no effective response to it. It seems clear that the, the richness of life produced by evolutionary history comes at a very high cost in suffering, as Darwin suggested. If we grant that the existence of these diverse life forms is an intrinsic good, we may nonetheless wonder whether this good is worth having, given, not for us, but for them, given the miseries that come along with it. The creator of this world sometimes appeared to care more about the proliferation of living things than about the well-being of individuals. God may take note of the sparrow's fall, but God also blesses the sparrow the sparrow hawk, a kestrel, with the sparrow as its meal. We had kestrels living around our house in the main countryside and I enjoyed watching them, watching them hunt. So God's goodness to one is death to the other. This God is not a benign cosmic benefactor who is concerned only with individual well-being. The God of evolution seems better depicted as the numinous power who speaks to Job from the whirlwind and who takes Job on if I can put it this way, a whirlwind tour of the wonders and terrors of the universe. There is grandeur and mystery and beauty here, uh, inex inextricably linked to fear and pain and death. These values cannot be realized without these disvalues. Should we renounce the values out of concern for the disvalues? I think this may come to a matter of contending intuitions, but my own judgment is that we need not deny the value of a world that is ambiguous in this way. We, like the rest of our fellow creatures, including the ones that we eat, we live fragile and perishing lives. And it is these lives that have intrinsic value for us uh, and for God. To affirm the value of life on these terms is to say with Job, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's the first response. Second response uh, to the problem of suffering in non-human living things. Second response um, focuses on the good which is yet to come. The first focused on the good which is realized here and now. Okay? The second is an eschatological good. The primary concern of the Christian faith is to articulate a vision of what God is doing to address and overcome evils. As classically understood, this divine redemptive action is truly extraordinary. The creator of our ambiguous world in which goods and evils are linked in such subtle ways does not unleash these processes and then remain immune from them. 
Rather, God identifies in the most intimate possible way with the suffering creation, entering the world as a particular person and assuming human vulnerabilities. This is the stunning central claim of the Christian faith, of God's incarnation. It has a decisive bearing on the problem of evil. It doesn't explain why creation takes the shape it does, but it does affirm that God's purpose for the world is to be with us and for us in a relationship that cannot be destroyed either by the evil we do or the evil we suffer. Within the terms of this Christian story, God's presence to suffering is not merely a passive compassion, an inactive co-suffering. Rather, it promises an end to suffering and evil and the healing and restoration of the sufferer. It's interesting that uh, some of the gospel stories make the point of insisting that the wounds of the risen Christ don't vanish, right? Hence the story of Thomas who wants to touch them. That image affirms that suffering is not simply ignored or negated in the final good that God brings into being. But these marks of suffering and evil no longer have in them the power of death. Here suffering is taken up into the life of God and stripped of its destructiveness. It is suffused by life. This is a vision not simply of the restoration of a good that has been lost, as might be suggested by some readings of the of the fall story, but rather of the transformation of the creature and the completion of God's creative work. A long-standing tradition within Christian theology includes the entirety of creation in this eschatological transformation. Though the lives of non-human creatures have value in themselves as they are lived here and now, that was my first point, they too, nonetheless, might be taken up into a completion and consummation of the whole created order. We obviously can't fill out very fully the story of the world's destiny in God's grace, and it's prudent to err on the side of saying too little rather than too much. I mean, should we affirm uh, that the promise of life with God beyond death extends to all individual creatures throughout the history of life? Some people have said that. It's hard to know what this would mean for many of those lives. Um, one thinks, for example, of the um, sparrowhawk, right? What would it mean for the sparrowhawk to have a life beyond death with God? I'm missing my very last page here, but I'm not going to worry about it. I will just finish it out. Um, uh, must the predator give up the hunt? Uh, what would it mean if, in fact, the lion lies down with the lamb and eats straw like an ox? Would the lion any longer have a life that a lion would love? Okay. Um, we can't go very far with those speculations. We may, in fact, begin to lose our enthusiasm for um, a universal the inclusive eschaton by the time we get to, say, uh, bed bug heaven, uh, <laughs> bacterial paradise. I mean, you know, do we really want to count them in? So the point here is just to point to the limits of our ability to conceive of the consummation of all creation. But there are good grounds within Christian tradition and, and the, sort of the logic of, of the Christian faith to think of the redemptive relationship extending beyond simply human beings and embracing the whole of creation so that the God's creative act is part of a, of a um, long-term redemptive purpose in which all living things uh, eventually are included and we have an end of evils, an end finally of sorrows, the sort of thing that Isaiah seemed to anticipate. Thank you. Well, since we have all the answers, I doubt that there's any discussion or... No, I invite you now, the microphones are available here, and Tom is happy to hear your remarks, your discussions. Um,
theologians, scientists, philosophers, students, professors, fawns, bedbugs, anybody that would like, Don, please. First, uh, thank you very, very much. It was a fascinating talk and, and a very, very important topic. Um, I'm wondering, as you were talking, um, not so much about the issue of moral evil, which makes sense the way you, you, you describe it, but um, amoral evil. Um, we, it's commonly, we identify suffering and death with evil, amoral evil. But if evil is that which ought not to be, and suffering and death ought to be in this larger context of evolution, is it correct to say that they are evil? Yeah, that's exactly the question I wanted to raise. It looks as though uh, suffering and death uh, are built into the evolutionary process. And if we affirm that the evolutionary process is the means by which God generates this spectacular uh, proliferation of life forms, then it looks like death has been built into the creator's purposes. That stands in pretty sharp contrast to the way in which death has often been thought about in the Christian tradition, where death is the enemy. Death is that which is to be destroyed. It is a kind of interloper. It has been introduced into God's otherwise good creation. That part of the story looks as though it has to change. It may still be that death must finally be overcome in, this, in the consummation of creation. But in the meantime, it looks like death has a place in God's purposes for created things. Uh, it doesn't mean we should embrace death like death, <laughs> you know, go gently into that good night. Um, but it, 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 it would be interesting to think about the implications of this changed attitude toward death uh, for the way we live and die. It might, I mean, one of the things I do, as George mentioned, is some bioethics and bioethics consultation. And one of the things we face in that context all the time is um, a kind of desperate resistance to death, often on the part not of the dying person, but of the dying, but on the part of those who love the dying person. And it's one of the, it's probably most of the people in this room know, one of the most difficult things one has to do in life is to decide that it's time to stop trying to extend the life. Very difficult decision to make. Um, but maybe, you know, there's a connection between this, the impact of evolution on our theological reflection and our capacity to respond compassionately at the bedside of the dying. You've invited us to not focus too narrowly on the death of one fawn and also to consider the perspective of the babies of the hawk vis-a-vis -vis the, the sparrow and look to the larger process. There's a danger in that, I think, in that one tends thereby to underestimate the phenomenal amount of suffering and death in that larger process. That is to say, in every instance of speciation, where we go from one species to more species. And with every um, adaptative trait of every species, that emerges over time only by the suffering and death of all those that don't have that uh, adaptive trait. So that the, the cost of pushing towards this diversity and such like, it's nice to focus on, oh, this was very adaptive, all right, well, for camouflage, for example. But what that means is that every organism that didn't have that trait necessarily had to suffer and die. And so that when we look just at the delightful things that have emerged from these evolutionary processes, uh, where there's a tendency to ignore the fact that as it is, every organism that didn't have the adaptative trait had to die. And then the way that that works with the problem of evil is could an omniscient, omnipotent, and benevolent God figured out a way of having these adaptive traits emerge without it being the case that 
all the organisms that didn't have it had to die. Yeah, I, you state the problem very nicely. I mean, you're exactly right that that's, that is one of the central um, challenges presented by, the, by evolution for thinking about a god who's omnipotent and, and, and perfectly benevolent. So think of the predator-prey contest. There's a kind of you know, evolutionary biologist talk about the predator-prey uh, arms race, right? And the way the predator keeps getting better is to be up against better and better prey. The prey survive uh, when some members of their population are run a little faster uh, or deploy whatever the better strategy is for, for getting away. And the prey animals, the, the predator animals flourish who have the means to overcome that uh, escape behavior. And so they're both engaged, they're engaged constantly in this deadly contest. So I completely agree, that is, that is a profound, that's the problem I'm trying to grapple with here. Well, I think you let yourself off the hook much too easily here in looking at predator and prey and calling it an arms race. Um, the analogy there is with agency, for example, the Soviet Union and the United States each intending to do certain things. The way you get the faster prey or the more acute predator is by killing off all the other ones. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. it, it's not an act of agency or outsmarting at all. It's large populations that are destroyed. Yep. So um, again, the perspective here is not unimportant to think. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not just smart ones live. It's that all the other ones die. Yeah, I, it, I, I have no objection to what you're saying. I, I don't see it as an objection to what I presented so much as a restatement of the central problem that I'm trying to grapple with. The cost of evolutionary processes in suffering and death is enormous. So, and one can't simply appeal to the remarkable results of those processes to vindicate the means by which they were produced. Yeah, I, I would say it's exponentially enormous, but we're cool. Thank you. Andy. I have a bit of a problem with uh, this. There is an anthropomorphism in one's interpretation. The predator prey is a good example. When we say that the lion will lie down with the lamb, I mean, this is the most unnatural situation I can imagine. And uh, I just wanted to give you a very brief example. Uh, the 1940s, uh, 29 reindeer has been introduced in uh, St. Matthew's Island in North Pacific. There were emerg emergency food source for a surveying group. They didn't need it. They left the island and left the reindeer. Very short time, it was a lush uh, vegetation, very short time, they were over 6,000. And uh, there was a severe winter, and there was a population crash, the vegetation could not recover, and they reduced to 49 individuals, which were very sickly and died out in a few more years. You see, there is a situation, that pre the prey without the predator, the timber wolf, which is the predator, was not introduced. In other words, it created an off-balance situation, which is, uh, I would say, the, the evil thing in an evolutionary situation. What happens on the mainland, and the two populations are in wonderful balance, and they both survive. And balance means survival, which is a natural good. When we uh, speak about uh, uh, bad things, uh, very often, I would say that uh, many of them are of human origin, and let's take care of those, and not to worry so much about the, the, the natural uh, situation. The natural situation is in balance. So it satisfies me. Mm -hmm. I don't see any evil in that. See, the well, suffering yeah. is a human concept. There, there is no problem about natural evil, which is a term that's often used, unless you understand the order of nature and these balanced ecosystemic relationships that you're describing <clears throat> to be the result of the creative activity of God. 
So in a, in a purely naturalistic context, I think you're right, it makes no sense to talk about natural evil. There is certainly, it makes sense to talk about natural suffering, that's why I tend to use that term. Um, but evil presupposes uh, a, more, a context of moral evaluation. Outside the context of moral evaluation, you just have patterns of life and death, of suffering and so on. Um, so so it's that, this is a problem for theists. It's, the atheists don't have the same sort of problem. They have a, a, another problem, a problem about understanding the good <laughs> and its place in the scheme of things. But you know, you know in, in other words, uh, science and uh, faith are in no contradiction whatsoever for a theist, of course. I would say that, you know, when you read the book of Genesis, uh, the God created the world, which people looked around, it was flat, let's say. And then uh, the understanding of the world improved, it more precise, it became geocentric. That means God created the geocentric world. And then it became heliocentric, created by God. And then it became an unfolding reality, which is being created by God, because God is in absolute presence. You see, and uh, I would say that my science really gives realism to my faith, and my faith gives meaning to my science, so the two can live happily ever after. The, the, <laughs> the great Protestant theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher uh, said in his uh, speeches uh, in, what, uh, 1799, uh, that if you have uh, no taste, no sense of wonder, and, and no sense of, in his word, piety, a sense of reverence for the universe, then you ought not to do science. And if you do do science, you're likely to acquire that sense of wonder. So it's, it's, I hear echoes of that in what you say. Let's move to the left here a bit, to, to my left at any rate. Please. Uh, yes, well, extending on that note, uh, I'm thinking of we're in the notion of suffering. <coughs> I'm thinking more of a notion of, say, spiritual suffering versus natural suffering, because we're thinking about suffering, we're thinking of things like the fawn, or thinking of you know, pestilence like HIV. But I'm reminded of uh, the writings of Meister Eckhart, who said that suffering was just a state of mind, uh, which is caused by our wanting and uh, our lack of being in connection uh, of a spiritually pure state. And also someone made the, uh, made the point uh, to me earlier today when I mentioned this, this talk, that um, even if you read the book of Genesis literally, you can't say that there was no uh, plant death before the fall, because obviously what were Adam and Eve eating when they were uh, in the garden. So what if we just imagine suffering, take it out of the naturalist conception and reimagine it in the spiritual conception, because someone like Eckhart, if he was stricken with HIV or stricken with, with, um, with, well, with pestilence, would, uh, would rejoice in the fact to experience the suffering of Christ, which he says was, uh, which he emphasized for any true believer to attain uh, the spiritual state of illumination. Yeah, let me say two things. One, that, that there are uh, depths of suffering which are possible only for uh, creatures like us with our range of mental capacities, our capacity to anticipate the future, to recall the past, to suffer in anticipation of what is yet to come, and to suffer from the sense of the loss of a past which is gone. So there, there are, so suffering is more than just pain. Suffering has a spiritual dimension to it, and it's, the capacity for that kind of suffering is part of the price we pay for the richness and complexity of our moral and spiritual lives. Then your second point about the uh, spiritual benefits of suffering. Um, there certainly can be such. I didn't talk about that here. Uh, but I want to be careful at that point not to recommend to sufferers that they learn from their suffering. That may be something that some folks discover in the course of grappling with their suffering. Uh, but it's not something which a, seems to me a third party ought to recommend to them. Instead, we should be more like Job's comforters before they opened their mouths. If, if you remember, 
if you remember that story, they show up, right? Job is uh, he's utterly miserable. He's sitting there in the town dump, covered with boils, scraping the, with bits of broken pottery. What a picture of human wretchedness. His friends arrive, and they sit with him in silence for seven days. And the first person to break the silence is Job himself. Right? Uh, they don't speak until Job speaks. As soon as they start talking, things go downhill in a hurry. But they are, their silence is actually quite articulate. A, a, to be compassionately with someone facing suffering is one of the more difficult things to do because we tend to feel we need to speak to it, we need to explain it, we need to offer a, uh, a response to the problem of suffering. Uh, and I, part of what I was saying tonight about the limits of our ability to explain is we shouldn't, in many contexts, try to explain. Uh, we're not gonna be able to do it successfully. And it may well substitute for what ought to be um, compassionate presence with another human being. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think we better move along here, please, on my right here, if you would. Uh, uh, your lecture includes uh, the embracement of what seems to be a combination of dualities in, within the whole of creation, uh, the embracement of uh, both evolution and creation, uh, benefit and suffering, and both causal evils and, and moral evils. Um, I was wondering, is it possible that God himself suffers from a lawful natural order? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> I suggested that toward the end, that God's, in the Christian scheme, entry into the human condition is an identification with the physicality of the created world and accepting into the divine life the, uh, the inevitable wounds that, and losses that come with our bodliness. And so it does seem to me that this idea of, of uh, incarnation and, and God's suffering in the world has a role to play in trying to think about uh, and respond to the problem, not just of moral evil, but of uh, natural suffering, the suffering of non-human um, creation. But I haven't worked that out. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Uh, I guess the question I have to ask is, no. given uh, your talk, uh, why Christianity? Why not say Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, even the Greco Roman paganism would, you know, could fit a view. Uh, I guess my response would be it's we want to discuss this kind of problem in the context of all of the above, but we're best off doing it one at a time. So, you know, I could give you a talk about suffering in the context of, say, Theravada Buddhism and the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path and so on. Um, and that's a really interesting thing to think about in comparison to um, a Christian, Jewish, Muslim, theistic conceptions of God's relation to the world that they create a rather different problem about suffering. So, um, but on any given, uh, what I think it's useful for us to have conversations across the boundaries of religious traditions about topics like this, where we seek to learn from one another about how the shape of the problem, how it's articulated, and how it can be addressed uh, within these different religious contexts. So, so I'm working out of the, the background of, for this talk and, and my, most of my work, in a context of Christian tradition and theology. Uh, but that doesn't, that's not to say that there aren't other ways of going at these issues. But you only get a really thick, interesting, three-dimensional um, conversation about these things if you move deeply enough into, it seems to me, one, uh, one or more of the traditions that 
have emerged as human beings have grappled with the conditions of our existence. So do it one at a time, or maybe two at a time, but <laughs> on any given occasion, it seems to me, it's perfectly okay for someone to, to work with just within the, the boundaries of, of one. When I teach these issues, we usually read texts from all three of the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Thank you for the answer. That was an excellent one, I think. <laughs> Thank you. And okay. can I use uh, your, uh, you know, can I use what you've said here in my thesis? Because I think you make some good points I could use. If it helps, that's great. If Thank you, you can spot the points at which there are errors, let me know. I'm still working on it. At this stage, we're going to yield to you, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it, and I, uh, I think we have to certainly, for the future of Christianity and maybe religion in general, begin thinking in an evolutionary way and translating our different doctrines in an evolutionary way. There was, there was something that I just identified that sort of um, I responded to, and we seem to be talking in an evolutionary way, but with our same Greek conception of God, with the introduction of terms like omniscient and intervention. I'm not here to deny that God is omniscient or intervention or interventionist, uh, but I think that we need to explore a new way of talking about God. Uh, we, the argument seemed to assume that we all were there. That's just my comment. <laughs> yeah, there are, of course, multiple ways of thinking about God. I mean, Christianity is not a monolithic tradition. Uh, in fact, um, I often say to students that it's a mistake to think of religious traditions as having a single stable content. A religious tradition is, in fact, it seems to me, an ongoing conversation, uh, uh, a kind of a fight that lasts for centuries. Uh, and often the central question that people fight over is, what is the essential content of our, of our religion. So they're, so they're internally religious traditions multivocal. There are multiple ways of, of thinking and speaking. This problem, the problem about God and evil, gets its sharp edges from the juxtaposition of classical Christian claims about God's goodness and power and knowledge with the reality of the way the world is. There are other ways to think about God, and one of, the, one of the things that might recommend them to us is if we think we really cannot reconcile these traditional ways of thinking about God with the reality of evil. One can always solve, it's not a solution at all, it's a concession, the problem of evil by saying, you know, God would like to help, but God can't because God isn't sufficiently powerful. So, and that that's a move that people do, in fact, make. And so there are, so I was, I'm, tr I'm trying to, to sharpen the edges of the problem, to present it in its most difficult form, and then see what we can say about it. I think the problem of evil will always be one of the most difficult things, but it seems if we're going into an evolutionary mode of thought, we have to think of God in a new way, too. I'm not sure that's the easy way out. Yeah, that may turn out to be that may turn out to be the case. Um, and process theologians, if you're familiar with process theology, uh, drawing upon the philosophy of uh, Whitehead and Hartshorn, um, uh, have some resources that help them. It seems to me in thinking about the problem of evil, though, what helps them the most is that they tend to deny that God is the creator, the absolute creator of the world, uh, and, <clears throat> and therefore deny that God has, that God is omnipotent. So, and, and that may be the way to go. Uh, I'm just exploring the possibilities for trying to f express the problem in, it, in the sharpest terms and in seeing what we can do with it. Um, in your lecture, you talked 
multiple times about the book of Genesis and the creation of the world. And in Christianity, along with several other religions, I'm sure, it mentions that the world was created in nature good. And you talk about pain and suffering and how they're human creations and they're necessary evils. But if an all-powerful God isn't able to rectify these necessary evils, what does that say? What do you believe that says about the afterlife? I think, um, I mean, there's a bunch of points in there. Um, one key thing to say is um, that the strategy of theodicies, if you're, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with that word, but attempts to justify <clears throat> the goodness of God in the face of suffering and evil. Um, grapple with those three questions that I asked, right? And the attempt, the strategy in answering those three questions is to try to identify a good which cannot, logically speaking, conceptually, cannot be achieved without permitting or producing various evils. So uh, if that is the case, and if God wills that good, right, then it's not a limitation on God's power that God cannot achieve that good without permitting or producing evils. Because that's a, there's, a, there's a logical link between the evils and, and that good. So that's, that's what the Odysseys try to do, and that's what I was trying to do tonight. Now, it seems to me in that enterprise, um, a life with God beyond death has an integral role. I think it's going to be very difficult to, explain, to give an adequate account uh, of God's permission of evils in the world if there is not a life with God beyond death uh, in which the creature, the wounded creature can be healed, redeemed, and taken up into to participate in the good that God intends in creation. So it seems to me that in, in really all three of the monotheistic traditions, but clearly in Christianity, um, you have a single narrative line that stretches from creation to consummation, from the beginning to the end. And in order to try to construct an account of why there would be evil included in that narrative, you have to, you have to, to, to look at the entire story. And that's going to include um, some kind of eschatological um, completion, right? And not just what takes place here and now. Without the latter, I think it's going to be very hard to, uh, uh, to, to respond to the problem of evil. I don't, does that speak to what you're trying to say? Yes, I was just wondering more along the lines of, I'm not saying that it's necessarily an evil, I'm saying that it, pain and suffering is a human creation. I was wondering if you believe pain and suffering is a necessary thing for life to justify in the afterlife, or if it was actually justified in the afterlife, in your opinion. I think it would it, it would be healed and and redeemed from from meaninglessness in the afterlife. It wouldn't be, be that by suffering, one merits uh, a reward. Instead, uh, suffering is a side effect of creating a world in which it's possible to achieve certain kinds of good, the good of uh, complex moral and spiritual life in which we learn through trial and error to love one another, to love the world in which we find ourselves and to love God. That's the sort of the soul-making idea. That's a very costly process. It's a process that goes wrong in these persistent and deep ways. And then the question is how does, it, how does all that goes wrong get made right? So I tend to think of the afterlife as um, part and parcel of the redemptive or salvific process that Christians see already initiated in the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. Thank you. The answer was very much. Thank you. Um, the last one. At the risk of Tom being worn down so we send him to the afterlife too soon, <laughs> I'm going to ask these to be the last two interventions. I can't chase off Stephen or I'll be fired. So we'll Please. No, we've used, we've used the word evil 
a lot here, but you didn't really define it. Uh, does it have to have a moralistic part? And see, as a physician and treating disease, I don't consider disease evil. I consider right. it the lack of good yep. or some kind of a disorganizational thing <clears throat> where things are rearranged and they're actually good things, but they're rearranged in the wrong order or lack of order. Right. And I don't consider it as evil. In fact, some of the things I actually like pain. I tell my patients, if it wasn't for pain, we, the human race wouldn't be on the planet. They wouldn't we'd, come to see you if something didn't off, hurt. We'd uh, get injured. Uh, same with cancer. Cancer yep. is actually a excessive good. The tissue is over healthy yep. and it becomes autonomous. It wants to be on its own. So you have to look, and when you say it's bad or evil, is it moralistically have to be a part of the definition? Yeah, evil, it seems to me, is a moral category. Uh, badness isn't necessarily a moral category. So there can be bad states of affairs that afflict us or afflict other living things. Um, whether they could be called evil or not depends upon their origins and context. So when, you know, if I intentionally inflict on another human being some bad state, I hurt them, I, you know, damage them in some way, I have done something morally wrong. And so I use evil just in the sense of moral wrongness, right? Some people want an even stronger sense of evil that, that simply um, uh, a morally wrong act is not an evil act. To be evil, it has to be somehow extra, extra bad. It has to be diabolical. It has to be, you know, sort of imaginatively vicious. And uh, I understand that use. But in the literature, in the, in the philosophy of religion and theology, talking about the problem of evil, um, evil usually is just used as a synonym for morally wrong acts. That's why one can ask, as a questioner over here did, about whether we should even talk about natural evils, since, nat since bad stuff just happens in nature, it's built into the structure of things. And my response to that was, yeah, you're right. It isn't evil unless we set it in the context of a, the, the activity of God, who creates a world in which these bad things happen. And then we ask, was it evil of God to do that? So that's where the problem of evil idea and comes disease from. Disease would not be evil then. But in the eyes of God, would disease be evil? Um, as a part of the universe, that this is something that is inflicted? I mean, uh, or not inflicted? Yeah, it's, you know, one of the questions I was asking here tonight was, what do we say uh, if we embrace an evolutionary story in which death and all the suffering associated with death and all the kinds of injuries that can occur in, in nature are an integral part of the world that God made? They, they aren't a an interruption, uh, a destructive interposition into an otherwise good and harmonious creation. That was the Augustinian picture, right? And that vindicates God with regard to these, these sources of suffering and misery. Uh, if we give up that picture, then we integrate into God's creative purposes um, death, right? It's part of what powers evolutionary change. Uh, and um, so it looks as though death is part, if we're going to affirm the goodness of creation, it seems to me we've got to affirm the goodness of being, of our own mortality and the, and the mortality of other living things. I mean, I had a little section in here where I commented on, it, it's our, we live these fragile and perishing lives. Uh, and yet it is those lives which we value and declare good. And it seems to me that in the biblical traditions when creation is declared good, it ought to be that very creation and not this primordial unfallen state where nothing bad ever happens to anyone. So if health is overpoweringly uh, so good that it almost neutralizes some of the bad that comes with disease. I mean, we're so fortunate to be healthy that, that when you take, subtract <coughs> the disease from it, it, it somehow, uh, and maybe that's true in all of the universe, that the, that the goodness actually overbalances 
Yeah, I think it's a hard case to make there. I think human beings and other living things suffer so profoundly and are in fact are destroyed by their suffering. Sometimes, not in every case, but um, that it does damage to us as persons in our moral and spiritual and interpersonal relational center. I do not want to deny those, those aspects of our shared reality and paint too rosy a picture in which you know, there's always a payoff for every instance of suffering. Part of what I'm arguing here is that there isn't, that a, a lot of bad stuff happens in the world that uh, is bad for the creatures to whom it happens. They'd be better off without that. And yet, the exposure to such risk is an integral part of the context within which certain goods are made possible. So at that level, I want to agree with you. But we could get a little debate going between you and the gentleman earlier, I think maybe the first questioner who was saying, you know, look, evolution is not a happy story. It's not as if we always get out of the evolutionary process these, these, these happy conclusions of really well-adapted creatures. Uh, what we get is a whole lot of suffering and dying along the way. I entirely agree. So I do not want to, to try to vindicate God's creative activity by means of, of evolution, by downplaying the destructiveness, the harshness of the evolutionary process. I really sympathize with Darwin's own mixture of mixed emotions about the processes which he himself observed so perceptively, so acutely, right? describing in great detail how these interacting relations of organisms work and also how appalling they are in the, the losses that are suffered along the way. One last, I shouldn't keep going on, one last remark. What you, your comments put me in mind of Augustine who defines evil as a privation of the good. Many of you may be aware of that idea that evil is not itself a, a, a force, a substance, an entity. It's just the diminishment of something that is already good. And his standard example of this is health and disease. Disease is not itself a thing apart, there's the germ, there's a the virus, whatever, but, but that's not itself a bad thing. That's just another creature making a living. It happens to be making a living last week in my sinuses not welcome there. Uh, my immune system is managing to, to knock it off. So. Yeah, right. We've saved the last for the last. Um, and I did not stand up with the intention of saying this, but I can take a hint from who is really the boss. Um, clearly, there's desire for more conversation. May I suggest that the oh. conversation now continue Certainly. over sweets and coffee, That's and without preempting George's right, invite everyone <laughs> to thank our speaker.